What is Safety Day? Uh, safety Day is an opportunity for us to review and practice our own safety procedures. Um, we get to perhaps learn some new ideas um, that are perhaps more directly su suited to us as qualified jumpers. There's practically no one that's jumping the canopy that they were taught on with their ground school. We're not jumping mantas, 280, 290 square foot student canopies with a student AAD and an RSL and, and everything else. And whilst we've seen more people with RSLs these days, there are substantial differences to the equipment that we use and therefore how we should approach certain scenarios. It's also, of course, an opportunity for you to ask questions. You know, whilst the staff here are relatively approachable on most days, uh, and also relatively skilled in what they do. Um, today is directed for you. It is here so that you can ask us questions and find out um, the information that you want to do. That's really where Safety Day came about. You know, we were very good. We knew we were quite good in the UK and in America at teaching students, and we could see that injury rates and such like were dropping in that area, but we were also aware, particularly with the smaller and the faster parachutes that we were using as um, experienced jumpers, that we were not really doing enough in that sector. So Safety Day has evolved over the last sort of 10 to 15 years um, to work with experienced jumpers. A guy called Bill Booth, he invented, or was a large part of in the invention of tandem equipment. He owns and runs UPT, who make vector containers. He said a long time ago, actually, that you should educate yourself about gear and then only jump gear that is designed for how you jump. So many fatalities occur because of decisions jumpers make before even getting in the aeroplane. Don't join that group, be smarter than that. He's essentially saying, educate yourself about everything you can relating to skydiving, and you will not only be a better and safer skydiver, you'll create a, a better safety um, awareness amongst other people as well. We as experienced jumpers show the next generation just visually from the things that we're wearing, the things that we're doing, what is acceptable and what is not. And we want to give them a, um, a good impression of what we're doing. So be smart with what you're doing. It doesn't just affect you and the people you're jumping with, it affects everybody in skydiving. Good. So, Bob is dead. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I went to a sort of murder mystery evening uh, a couple of months ago, and during that time, and Laura was present, as you can tell, uh, we were presented with a, a series of clues and statements and, and such like that guided us through this death of a person, and then we had to consider the evidence and try and work out <laughs> what happened, who we thought of it. So. This is kind of my skydiving twist on, on an event. Um, it's entirely fictitious. It doesn't relate to anybody, <laughs> or any packer, kit owner, or anything else. Um, I have simply sat down yesterday and made up a series of events and statements um, that led to poor old Bob's demise. Um, so what we're really asking is, did someone kill Bob? What happened? Why did Bob die? Could we have done something about it? So who was sort of capable of saving him? Who contributed to his death? So let's start with some basic information for you. Bob was an experienced and current skydiver. About 400 jumps, sensible enough. He was doing a three-way sit jump with his friends, Timmy and Tommy, also fictitious. <laughs> I'm not aware of any Timmy and Tommy's jumping together. Uh, Bob was using his own parachute. He was familiar with it. He jumps it regularly. Uh, they were on lift four. The weather was good. Uh, the jump master uh, said the flight, the spot, the exit, everything seemed normal. So nothing of great concern. Soon after Bob's exit, uh, the container was seen to be open. The main bag started its deployment. Timmy, wearing a camera of course, they're free flyers. Uh, stated that it looked like <laughs> the main canopy wrapped around Bob's arm play nicely. Uh, their pilot chute was not deployed. Bob seemed to remain in a sit position for the rest of the skydive. His AAD fired, as you'd expect, um, but unfortunately he had a main reserve entanglement. So really, uh, it looks like we've just simply had a very unfortunate accident. You agree with that? It's just an accident? 
Mm, there's a few no's and yes. And so the question here is, you know, what factors led to this? What do we know? Do we need more information? We do. We need more information at this stage. So there was a, an investigation. Uh, what they found was the kit was great. Yeah, it was all in date. It was all as it should be. It was fully serviceable. It was in good condition. You know, the BOC pocket was tight and secure. It, it kept the pilot chute in there. Uh, they found a slightly worn closing loop, uh, but the loop was intact. So it suggests that that was not actually a particular factor. Uh, their kit had been packed by a qualified packer at the center. Nothing of great concern in that area. They found that Bob had been checked and signed for by his friend Tommy. Everything appeared to be normal in that situation. And that the jumpers were suitably qualified. So not a lot there, really. They did have some questions, though. They really want to know why his main container opened. They want to know why Bob didn't try to re rectify this situation. Why did he not move to a more face-to-earth position to gain more control and resolve the situation? Was it something that was preventing him from doing this? And of course, they're also assisting the police uh, in their investigation, which of course could result in criminal charges. So they've got specific concerns about the police investigation and the likelihood of that leading to charges against some or many people. What did the police find? Well, the police also interviewed everyone that was involved and they have raised questions. In particular, they're asking about the flight line check process. The police state that they found procedural problems with the checking process and in particular have listed Tommy as a person of interest. <laughs> All right, they've raised questions about the equipment serviceability. They cite that the bungee between the leg strap covers was missing and that it appears to have been replaced by a piece of string. This string they believe is referred to as a pull-up. They also note that the pull-up had broken. It was very worn and it had the appearance of something that had been fitted many jumps ago. They're investigating whether the packer should be the subject of criminal charges. Was the jump master performing their duties? The statement from the jump master is not consistent with events. Video footage from within the aircraft shows the jump master is participating in some type of hand clapping game whilst the victim is climbing out of the aircraft. It can be seen from this footage that Bob rubs his parachute across the door at the time and they are seeking expert opinion as to whether this is the cause of the premature opening of his parachute. The jump master was unable to assist in their inquiry. They admitted that they were not watching Bob and his group. The police are considering whether the jump master was adequately carrying out his duties at the time. This all leads to a larger question, which was the drop zone being run safely? Initial inquiries suggest that there may have been multiple safety failures in this situation. Does the drop zone need to be investigated? So are we still dealing with a tragic accident? Possibly not. Was it the fault of a specific person conspiring against Bob? Have we had people maliciously carrying out certain activities? Tommy and his flight line check, the packer, the jump master, the chief instructor. So again, this leads us to even more questions. What initially appeared to be just an accident now seems to have certain areas that need further investigation. So when further investigation comes to light, we find more information. It's clear that actually, Bob wasn't checked. Tommy admits that he signed for him, but he then forgot to complete the check. They found that Bob had what's referred to as an articulated harness. Do people know what that is, yeah? Well, you've got hip rings, so it moves around more easily, more comfortable, more easy to move around but has its limitations. He tied a pull-up between his legs. Um, this had snapped either during the jump as a result of the premature deployment 
or perhaps previously. It's unclear whether the packer has noted this or made any comment to Bob about it. And in his police interview, Tom stated that he knew uh, that Bob had broken the bungee. And in fact, he knew that Bob had tied a pull up there uh, a good couple of months ago. And he felt that was acceptable. Um, he'd seen other jumpers on the drop zone, some far more experienced than him with the equivalent piece of string tied between the legs. He thought that that was just an acceptable thing to do without really questioning it. The police continued to investigate whether the jump master was negligent. Uh, Bob was not checked, technically the responsibility of the jump master. Um, anyone on board had the opportunity to, to observe that Bob's leg strap might have been loose or wasn't tight. Uh, they note that the handshaking um, has become increasingly popular in the aircraft um, and that it can be a distraction to some people. In his statement, Timmy also commented that he normally wore a camera and that he'd seen Bob knock the main flap of his container open on previous jumps. But he never really thought that to be particularly important. He now reflects on that. They also discovered that Bob had downsized he was still wearing the same container, but had a different sized parachute in than originally uh, the container was manufactured for. Although it was regarded as acceptable by the manufacturer and classified as a loose fit, the board also believed that this could have been a factor into leading to the premature deployment. So where are we at this stage? Have we got simply just a tragic accident? Are we in a situation where now we think there are, there are things that could have been done to prevent this? Yeah, things change as we move on through the story. So the reality is there were factors that led to Bob's demise. Maybe his main parachute being slightly smaller was just one little thing. Just a series of simple, benign, things that combined to produce a terrible accident. The board and the police come to the following conclusions. The parachute was packed correctly by the packer. It's unclear whether the packer mentioned the lack of bungee or the condition of the um, pull-up between there. The worn closing loop didn't influence the jump in any way. Tommy failed to complete a flight line check on his friend. This was not done with malicious intent. It was simply something that Tommy did in order to help his friend, or he perceived that he was helping his friend. Both Bob and Tommy's acceptance that a visibly worn pull-up as a method of holding his leg straps together shows at least lack of knowledge, <coughs> more realistically perhaps a little complacency towards the hazards that are presented to us each time we go skydiving. The jump master wasn't necessarily going to know that Bob hadn't been checked. And in fact, all the paperwork was exactly as it should be. It would indicate that the process not only existed, but had been carried out. The jump master wasn't to know that Tommy had changed the way he was doing things. The jump master's lack of attention during the exit, again, not done necessarily with any malicious intent. However, something as simple as the jump master being close to the door pushing Bob's container away from the front of the door frame could well have prevented this fatality. Timmy was aware that his friend had a habit of setting up too far in the front of the door, occasionally knocking and opening his main container flap. He felt that it was just one of those things, not really worth bugging him. After all, Bob was a, an experienced jumper. Timmy didn't really want to mention it to him. Maybe he wishes he had. The police and board also note that the chief instructor was well known to regularly mention that jumpers uh, shouldn't use pull-ups between their legs, but should really tie it properly. In fact, both the police and the board thought the uh, chief instructor was a fantastic person. <laughs> <laughs> so the conclusion really is, was anyone to blame? And the answer to that really is no. No one wanted to see Bob die. Bob was well liked. <laughs> However, it's also arguable to say that several people had the opportunity to potentially prevent this. Just little benign steps 
could well have prevented this tragic accident from occurring. At least it's just a story. Yeah. It's all fiction. All of that was entirely untrue. Which is correct. The sad reality is that if we were jumping today, for example, if we went outside right now and watched people out on the flight line, I have no doubt we would find several people with articulated harnesses with no bungee or tied up loosely, poorly, by a pull-up of some form. The door's getting blocked. <laughs> yep. We'll have to start pushing people out the windows. All right, so um, if we look around outside, we can see these little factors exist. I know that on many occasions, I'll see people one or two minutes later than everybody else. They're running out there. Their friend has helped them, assisted them. Are they being helpful by signing the manifest before this person's been checked? Sometimes before the person's even got their kit on. They think perhaps they're being helpful, but maybe they're not. Are you the one that's always late for your flight line check? She's, n <laughs> she's not in here. All right, the girl the other day, desperately late, running up from the hangar. All right, Sean. Yeah, where's Sean? All right. Um, ask yourself, does that two minutes where you're sat still inside um, before kitting up, really important to you. Is it actually making you that so much cooler? If you're a serial latecomer or you know someone, tell them. Maybe you're going to do them a favor. The reality is that what we see here is that every accident is preventable. There's no such thing as an accident when it occurs that we look back on and say, oh, well, it's impossible to have stopped that. But to prevent accidents, we need everyone to participate. And that's the bit that sometimes slips past. Um, yes, we've got staff. Their eyes are open. They're looking around. But what we actually need is every participant involved, everybody that pulls into this car park to participate in the active, active safety culture of the centre. If we walk around with our eyes open, with a questioning mind, why is that not a bungee? Why is that slightly different to what I've normally used to? Um, then we stop this you know, deviance from normality <laughs> and we keep things safe. So your part in our safety is at least as important as the staff and everybody else's. You're probably in a better position to look at your kit and go, I'll take that off and I'll replace it with something a little bit better. I will just change that closing loop because it does actually need doing. Those little factors are the factors that prevent us from having incidents and problems that shouldn't be occurring. So yeah, it's all just made up, but it reflects a lot of what we see in reality. There we go. Nice quick one to start the day. <laughs>